Have you ever seen a football game where one team is winning and it's in the final minutes of the game and the coaches for the winning team completely change their strategy? Instead of trying to score more points by throwing a pass or doing the normal runs, the quarterback simply takes the snap and takes a knee. What the coaches are saying in this situation is, as long as we don't make a mistake, if we don't throw an interception or fumble the ball, we're golden. We're going to win this game, so let's be extremely conservative and then just let the clock run out. Well, the same idea applies to us as real estate investors who are building wealth and trying to cross the finish line of financial freedom. And yet there are a lot of real estate investors who've essentially already won the game. They have a lot of rental properties. They've built a large net worth, and yet they're still playing the original game. They're doing the equivalent of risking throwing interceptions and fumbling the ball and losing everything they've worked many, many years to achieve. Warren Buffett says this, it's insane to risk what you already have for something you don't even need. So in this episode, I want to show you how to follow Warren Buffett's advice and switch the real estate investing game we're playing so you can actually win the game of financial freedom and have more cash flow, have more free time, and have peace of mind so you can sleep well at night. Now, to win the ultimate financial game, it helps to think about your real estate investing journey in three distinct phases. Now, this is an idea I got from a longtime teacher and investor named Pete Fortunato. And Pete always said that the first stage you go through is just becoming a starter. You're a new investor and your objective isn't to win the financial game. Your objective at that point is just to get in the game. You just got to get a property or two under your belt. You got to get your foot in the door because sometimes it's the most difficult step is that first one to get that first property. And so as a starter, just getting any deal that's safe, that's reasonable, that's in a good location can often be a success because a lot of the growth that happens as a new investor is in between your two ears is the knowledge that you compound and you learn It's the relationships you build, the network you build, that knowledge and those relationships are what will really catapult you to the next level, to the next phase which is becoming a wealth builder. Now, a wealth builder has a really simple objective. You want to take a small amount of money that you started with, maybe that's 50,000 bucks, 100,000 bucks, and you want to turn that smaller amount of money into a lot more money, maybe a million dollars or two million or three million dollars. So the name of the game, the game you're playing at that point is growth. Now, you want to do it safely, but you want to be a little bit more aggressive. This is why leverage in real estate investing is such an important tool. Being able to put a small down payment or to be able to refinance and pull some of your money back out to go do another deal is the strategy. That's the technique that a lot of people use to grow from that small amount of money into a much larger amount of money. Now, most of you are probably familiar with the wealth building stage because most of the podcasts, most of the courses, most of the books you read are techniques about that stage. But I have found that the third stage, which Pete calls the ender stage, and I like to think about it more like the harvesting phase, is a little bit different because instead of just trying to grow your wealth, you might want to still grow your wealth in the ender phase, but instead of just doing that, you reprioritize to start actually enjoying the fruits of your labor. You know, you've been working all these years, you've been pushing, you've been saving money. The ender stage is where you actually get to enjoy some of that and start producing some cash flow so you can actually live off your rental properties or be able to live off them to be able to reduce your risk so that you don't go back down the mountain that you just climbed up. So we're going to talk a lot about that. And then third, to become a time billionaire, to reduce the hassle that you have from your investments so that you can have the flexibility, the freedom to actually do what you want to do. For me and my family, that's been to travel, that's been to spend more time with my kids, that's to explore hobbies and a local nonprofit, do things in my local community that don't necessarily make money, but I really enjoy them and I'm passionate about them. That's the type of thing that a harvester or an ender is focused on, but you have to change your strategy a little bit and use real estate investing in a different way. So before we get to the techniques and the strategies, which I think you'll find very helpful if you're interested in making this transition from being a wealth builder into an ender or a harvester, I want to talk about the number one challenge I found as someone who's also had to go through that journey and that number one challenge was my personal psychology. So if you think about this, in that wealth building phase, you might have taken many, many years while you're building wealth. It could be a decade or more. And during that time, you establish some habits. You have this habit of focusing on growth, understandably, and you save your money and you invest it and use leverage and you keep growing. And you have a way of measuring success that works for that phase that you're in. But what happens is sometimes you get close to the original finish line that you set for yourself, those goals that you set for yourself, and we pull something that's pretty common. We move the goalpost a little bit further, to use another football metaphor. And so we said, well, just a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. 
And what I found for myself is that if you just measure growth and the amount of money you have as success, then it's never enough. But if you think about transitioning to a new type of game, the ender phase or the harvester phase, the objective there is not just to optimize your return on investment, is to optimize your life. And life is measured in heartbeats. It's measured in the amount of time we have to live on this earth. And so I'm not gonna tell you what your purpose in life is or what you wanna spend your time doing, but I do know that's a difficult part of the transition is figuring out what are you gonna do with your time. But I'm willing to bet there's something there that you thought about in the past that you wanted to do that was important to you, or maybe that you could do even within your business, but if you didn't need the money, if you didn't have to make money from it, if you didn't have to keep growing, you could do it in a different way. You could do it at a different pace, a different schedule. Maybe you could take a break and take many retirements like I've done. All that to be said is the psychology is probably gonna be the most difficult part. So even if you get the techniques and strategies, which we'll talk about, your own mindset and working on why you're making this transition could be the most important factor. So now let's look at some techniques which are unique to being an ender or a harvester. And by the way, if you find these techniques helpful, I covered them in a lot of detail in my book, The Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor. I have whole chapters on this ender phase and how to transition and how to do each one of these. And the first one I wanna talk about is something called pruning your portfolio. So if you look at all of your rental properties and whether you have five properties or 30 properties, my own business partner and I have 33 properties right now and that's 99 units. So over time we looked at it and we said, you know what, we're pretty much big enough. We like the stage we're in. We like the management infrastructure we have. If we had a lot more properties, we'd have to add even more management hassle to our lives. So we said to ourselves, this is kind of like having a garden or having an orchard of fruit trees. And when you're growing plants, one of the most important things you can do as the gardener or the farmer is to prune back your orchard. So if you have an apple tree, you don't wanna let all the branches grow because you won't grow as much fruit. So you actually need to cut off some of the branches so that all the energy goes to the other branches you have. And you can do the same thing with your rental portfolio. And the way we approach this, my business partner and I, is we looked at all of our properties and we put our own little ranking system together based on things that were important to us. So some of those were financial, like which ones perform the best financially and have the best amount of cash flow, the best amount of income. But we also looked at things like, which one of these is the, is the most hassle and the least hassle? And so the ones that are ranked top of our list might be the ones that attracted a really good tenant, it was in a good location, that tenant stay, tended to stay for a long period of time, and also that property from a maintenance standpoint didn't create as much hassle. So I'll give you an example of properties that did create a lot of hassle. We've had some properties where it basically had a lot of trees all around them. And every time there's a big storm, branches fall on the, on the house at a minimum, or sometimes they blow the tree over and it falls on the house. And yes, you can have insurance, but you have deductibles, you have to clean the roof up. So that's just one example. Those trees also get into sewer lines and septic systems, depending on what you have. So that's a very specific example. You can make a ranking of your properties based on financial criteria, but also based on which one of these is the least hassle to hold, is the least maintenance, attracts the best tenants, and you can just rank them. And so over time, we found that we had consistently, some of these properties were at the bottom, and we would prune those properties off by selling the properties. Now you have a couple of options once you sell off a property and decide to kind of get that out of your portfolio. Number one, you could replace that property with a new property. So this is sometimes called trading or exchanging to another property. And there's several different ways to do that. But the number one way that most people do it is something called a 1031 tax-free exchange. So if you have one house, and I'll give you a, a very specific example. We had a house that was kind of in another county, uh, not that close to us. So it was kind of hard to manage. The, the maintenance on the house, it was made of cedar siding. Almost every year, the, the, bee, the carpenter bees were just eating this thing alive. And so it was a nice home in the woods, good place to live, but wasn't a good rental property for us. But we had a lot of equity in the property. We had done well on that. So we sold that. And when we sold it, we also found another property, a new construction house that a builder friend of ours was building. And we put that property under contract to buy the new construction house. We sold our other house and we used this technique called a 1031 exchange to take our equity from that first property and not pay any taxes on it and then buy the second property. So today we have that new construction property, which is very low maintenance. It's in a good location, closer to us, easier to manage. And we took all the money, the equity we had in that tax-free and put it into this other property. So that's an example. When you prune, you can do what's called an exchange. There's a lot of details there. Look up tax, uh, 1031 tax-free exchanges. And if you want me to cover that more here on the channel, let me know in the comments below. So that's option A when you're pruning. Option B is just to sell the property and actually pay the taxes. 
Now, I know that's kind of sacrilegious, in the, especially when you're in the growth phase of real estate investing. But in this ender or harvester phase, sometimes that can make sense. You strategically pay taxes on something. Maybe you saved money all throughout the ownership of that rental property because you were making a lot of money. Now you're living off rental income. You have some good tax deductions. So selling that property, you pay capital gains tax on it. But then you use the cash proceeds, what's left over after that, to plow back, to take into your business, and maybe pay off debt on some of your other properties, which I'll talk about a little bit more here in a second. But the point is that pruning cleans up your portfolio makes it easier to manage, but it can also clean up your balance sheet. It can make it less risk by paying off debt. You might be able to increase your cash flow. And so that in the end, when you're done pruning, you've got more cash flow, you've got less risk, and you've got less hassle. So we've talked about the techniques of pruning your portfolio, of strategically refinancing, but a third technique is just rethinking how much debt you have in the first place. So when you first start investing, when you're a new investor, you get as little down as you can, you're using the most leverage you can. But as you become a mature investor, you're an ender, you're a harvester, I think it makes a lot more sense to start reducing your overall debt levels. Because if our goal is to reduce our risk, if our goal is to increase our income, if our goal is to have more peace of mind, having less debt is a big part of that. And one way I suggest you study this is look at all the big S&P 500 index fund type companies, so the biggest public companies in the United States, and look at their balance sheet. If you've never been in a stock investor, you might not have looked at this, but look at the balance sheet of the most wealthy, the most stable, the best long-term companies. And very rarely would any of these have more debt than about 25% of their overall asset values. So this is the equivalent of if you have a $200,000 property, very rarely would they have more than like $50,000 debt on a $200,000 value property. And so for you as a real estate investor, at least my goal has been to over time reduce my overall loan to value on my whole portfolio. Now, of course, you could do what we just talked about. Maybe you have 80% on one property and 0% on a few of them. But over time, you should also consider paying off the debt using techniques like the selling properties that I talked about earlier, prune the debt, pay the tax, pay off your debt. You can also do what's called a debt snowball which a lot of people use in personal finance, where you take the cash flow from all of your properties, and instead of spreading that out and paying off a little bit on all the properties, take all of your cash flow and aggressively pay down one debt at a time. So my business partner and I have done that, especially with some smaller mortgages, higher interest mortgages. We had some private money, second mortgages. We knocked those loans out really quickly and cleaned up our portfolio by reducing the amount of debt we had. Now, you can choose whether you want to take that all the way and have 0% debt, like some people just feel more comfortable with that. My business partner and I have felt more comfortable having some debt on the properties and not going all the way to zero. But definitely, instead of having a 70 80% loan-to-value portfolio or debt on our portfolio, we feel more comfortable having more like 15 20% overall. Another technique that'll help you transition to this ender or this harvester phase has nothing to do with paying off debt, has nothing to do with selling properties, but it has to do with the operations of your rentals. In other words, improving your systems, improving your technology, improving the team that you have. And this is a long-term process, but it's a super important one because in my own experience, we've done a lot of the optimization, the pruning of our properties, the paying off debt, and having a smaller number of rentals and just trying to grow forever is a big part of increasing the amount of time you have. But ultimately, if you want to get to the point, and for my business partner and I, it's about one to two hours per week is what we spend on our rental portfolio. You have to leverage other people's time. So you have to have property managers, for example. In our case, we have college student rentals, but we have a couple different property managers who lease those properties, who handle the maintenance calls, who talk to the contractors. And yes, we're involved. They'll send me a text, for example, if there's an expense that's over 500 bucks, and I have to approve that. But it's very rarely a lot of time on a week-to-week -week basis. It's me saying, yep, that sounds good. Go ahead and do that. And then they spend more time on it. So your team, your people who you work with are one of the most important factors to getting you to the point where where you're passive enough to have a lot of time to do other things. But even if you don't have a larger portfolio, you just have a few properties, you also want to work on your systems and your processes. Just by having simple checklists, for example, when the tenant moves out, here are the things we do. Or when we have a maintenance call, here's what we do. Here's the plumber we call. Here's the electrician. Just by being organized, that's essentially what systems and processes mean, is by being organized ahead of time before the crisis happens, before this bad thing happens, you can avoid a lot of the headaches that people associate with rental property investing. 
I have a mentor of mine, John Schaub, who's been on this show before, and I'm going to hopefully, hopefully have him again on the podcast as well. He has 20, 25 rental properties, the last I've heard, and he travels. He leaves for two or three weeks at a time. He goes all over the place. He has plenty of free time because his tenants live in these houses for many, many years because he has systems and processes, because he has the right properties in the right place, plus systems, he spends very little time and his tenants love being there too. They stay a long period of time. So this business of becoming an ender, a harvester, is part the types of properties you have, is part, part the debt you have, but it's part just being organized and running it like a business. You can work an hour or two per week max and have a passive enough business if you really focus on this side of being organized, having systems, using technology to their fullest. And this is a topic I wanna go in much more depth on, so leave me a comment below if you want me to cover this or what types of things you want me to cover when it comes to systems and processes. But this is something I plan on having a lot more content about in the future. So I want to summarize everything we've talked about here by telling you a story about my own personal journey as a rental property investor from a starter to a wealth builder to an ender. Because one of the common questions I received as I wrote the book and started talking a lot about this journey and getting to the point where you achieve financial freedom, people would ask me, how do you know when you're at the stage where you need to transition from being a wealth builder to an ender? How do you know you have enough money? How many properties should that be? And I think the question there implies that it's just one long journey. Like think about it like a mountain, like the bottom of the mountain when you're climbing up is the starter phase. And then the main steep part of the mountain is the wealth building phase. And then you get to the very top, the peak of the mountain where you achieve financial freedom. That's the ender phase. And it just seems like a kind of clear, delineated journey. When in reality, what I found during my own journey, well, there was a bunch of mini cycles. It was almost like you're spiraling up. And actually, sometimes you went down a little bit as well. And so it wasn't a clear path. And I want to show you kind of what those different stages were for me. So my personal journey started in 2003, and my business partner and I, we're still business partners today, got started as brand new rookie investors. I was such a rookie that I graduated from college in 2002, and I was living in the spare bedroom of my business partner's house. So I had zero income to be able to get into this business. And we actually got into the business of flipping houses, kind of as an active business. But eventually, a year or two later in 2004, we started also buying some rental properties. And so we transitioned into this from the starter phase, brand new rookies, just getting a deal or two under our belt into the wealth building phase in 2005, six and seven. Now, most of you who know your financial history know what happened in 2007. We entered the Great Recession, and that happened to be the, the year, very brilliant on our part, that we bought a lot of properties. So we had, I think, 30 plus closings during 2007, and some of those were multiple properties. So we hit like the hyper growth phase exactly the wrong time. Now, I can tell you that we survived that. We made a bunch of mistakes, but we also did some things well. One of the main reasons we survived is we saved a lot of money. We had a big, huge cash reserve, and we needed it for the next year or two. But what's interesting from this transition standpoint was as the market changed, we had grown enough wealth. We weren't financially independent by any means. We had done a lot of enough things wrong that we had negative cash flow and we had to feed some properties. But we had to we did have a kind of plateau of wealth at that point. And we hit a transition point where we went from wealth builder to a focus on reducing risk. That was the big transition point for us. We knew that we just needed to hold on to what we had already established. We needed to be able to pay our loans. We needed to be able to just stabilize this portfolio, work on our systems, work on our processes. So the focus of our business in 2000, end of 2007, and definitely 2008 and early 2009, so about a year and a half or two, was basically a little mini ender phase where we sold the properties we could, although we couldn't sell all of them during the Great Recession. We did a lot of strategic refinancing where we could, particularly with private loans, private lenders who we established relationships with. We started paying some debt off on some properties. If we could sell a property, we might pay off our most dangerous debt. So it was really about securing our portfolio, cleaning up our portfolio to the extent we could. It wasn't perfect. But then we also really worked on our operations to be good property managers, good systems, be able to, to rent the properties to people because we knew we had to hold on to more properties. So fast forward about an, a year or two later, the end of that ender phase, I did what I tend to do at the end of every one of these phases. My wife and I took our first mini retirement. So we didn't have kids at that point, but it was the end of 2009. 
I just needed a break. I had been pushing, 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 going. We survived the financial recession, and we at least knew we were okay there. We did not have enough cash flow to be financially independent, but I saved up some cash. My wife and I, and she took off some time from her job, and we went to Spain for six weeks, got our backpacks. I learned to speak Spanish there. Then we went to South America, to Peru, and we had our backpacks still, and we lived with a family for a month. I would continue learning to speak Spanish. We hiked to Machu Picchu. We went down to Patagonia in southern Chile and southern Argentina, spent another two or three weeks in Buenos Aires, and just had an amazing four-month mini retirement. And so that kind of capped off our little mini ender phase. But guess what? We didn't have enough money to do that permanently. So in 2010, we came back and we basically had to begin again as starters. We had to figure out a new financial market, a new lending market, you know, what, what are the prices? How does this work? So very quickly, we got out of the starter phase. We started buying some more rental properties and we moved into the wealth building phase. And I'll have to say, looking back, 2010 to 2016 was the biggest growth period of our life. We bought the most properties and we had the most activity like in 2007. We were busy, busy, busy. But deals that really made a difference and built our wealth was 2010 to 2016. Partly because that was a good time in the market to buy, but partly because we learned a lot. We learned our compounding of knowledge had really helped us out because I took a break and just kind of took some time off. But we were clearly in the wealth building phase. We bought multifamily properties in our uh, town of Clemson, South Carolina. Some of those were some of our best deals, as I said, produced a lot of cash flow. Some of those were value add deals where we fixed them up, turned them around, then refinanced them later on to stabilize them. But as we fast forwarded to the end of that five year period, 2016, 17, we were sort of this stage, again, me personally, where I wanted to take another break. And we had kids at that point, And my wife and I decided that we wanted to transition and live abroad for a while and live off some of the cash flow, the, the fruits of our work for the last period of time that we've been investing. And so we entered another ender phase at that point. We had to focus on systems. We had an internal bookkeeper who became our property manager. And we loved her. She was amazing. She ended up retiring a few years later. But she was our kind of go-to person on managing a lot of our properties. We had expanded a little bit, so we had more properties than she could handle. So we also added another property manager. And so we worked on those teams, and we worked on our systems and our checklists and our technology and our processes. We also worked on paying off debt. So we cleaned up our portfolio a little bit, pruned off some properties, sold the ones that were not optimal. And we did that over many, many years. It wasn't like an all-at-once thing, you know, cut two or three properties per year. But the point was, by 2017, we had had better properties. We kept the better ones. We kind of sold off some of the, the, the ones that we didn't like as much. And then for 17 months, my wife and I moved to Ecuador with our kids. And again, speaking Spanish, I wrote a book called Retire Early with Real Estate while I was there. I uh, played a lot of basketball. My wife taught English while she was there. We just had an amazing experience. And so that capped off another little mini cycle that we had. And I would say, you know, we did have enough income to live 100% off rental properties while we were there. And so that was a pretty amazing place to be. We were officially financially independent, financially free. When we came back though, we kind of entered another little mini stage of growth. We, it, was, it wasn't the same kind of growth, intense growth that we had in the past, but we decided, my business partner and I decided that, you know, we have some capital, we have some money that we've saved up. We could put that money into just paying all of all, all our properties. And that was one possibility. But the other possibility was we could invest it pretty conservatively and a couple more new properties, if it made sense, if they were high quality, if our debt to, to value ratio was at a conservative level that we were comfortable with. And so we chose to go that second route. We just ended up finding a couple of deals. We bought a 14 unit property, we bought another eight unit property that was a six, six unit building at a, at a duplex. They were right in our core market where we were trying to buy properties. We bought, this was when we did that 1031 exchange of selling the old property and buying a new construction property during this, this last period. And so from 2018, when we got back from Ecuador, all the way through 2022, was another little, not a starter phase, but another little wealth builder phase where we kind of moved up even more to another point where we had even more cash flow and we were in a pretty good shape. And so that brings you almost to the present. And last year, we capped off that little mini cycle with another uh, trip abroad, which is what we do. You know, some people go in RV and travel around the country. Some people decide to grow their garden or do some other kind of hobby. For us, it was travel. And so we moved to Spain for 12 months in Granada, Spain, and spent some time there. And we were clearly much more in the ender harvester phase at this point with our cash flow, with our stability of our portfolio. But the takeaway I want you to see, and there's even more details in between there, is this is not a clean, clear trip up the mountain. 
This is kind of a messy, you know, you take two steps forward, one step back. There's a lot of mistakes we made in the interim. But if you have your mindset on this idea of a journey and you have your mindset on why you're doing this, what you're trying to get to. And remember, it's about optimizing your life. It's about having rental property portfolios and wealth that is a tool to help you do what you want to do, whatever that thing is. My motto here at Coach Carson is do what matters. And so you only you know that. You know what success looks like for you. But I'm willing to bet that you need some cash flow to do that. You need some lots of free time to do that. You need some flexibility. And so really that's what I'm here to help you do. I'm, help, I'm here to help you figure out the journey, figure out the techniques to master the rental property game so that you can have that cash flow, you can have that free time, you can have that flexibility, but you also have to have the map of understanding is never gonna be a clear path. Your journey is gonna always be a little different than somebody else's, but there is a pattern, there's an approach you can take here. And the, the whole takeaway of this entire episode, of this entire video, if you're watching on YouTube, is that you have to think about your game a little differently depending on what stage you're in. If you're in the starter phase, play the starter game to the best of your ability. If you're in the wealth building phase, try to grow as, as much as you can, keep it safe, but grow that wealth as much as you can. And if you're at a stage where you feel like you wanna move into a transition to be an ender or a harvester, start using some of the techniques I've talked about today. You can start slowly with them, but don't be afraid to optimize your life instead of just optimizing your growth. It's super tempting. It's hard to make that psychological transition where you take some chips off the table, so to speak, if you're to use a poker metaphor. It's not an easy thing to do there because all of the pressure, all of the, the, the best practices, so to speak, of being a real estate investor is to continue growing, to, con to continue moving those goalposts. But I'm here to tell you, this is at least one person that it's worth it in the end if you start playing that different game and you're not giving up your ambition, you're not giving up your goals for the future, you're making a new set of goals. You're getting to ask yourself the question, what do I wanna do with my life now? And that's an amazing place to be. And even if you're not there yet, if you're early in your journey, this is something to aspire to. So no matter what phase you're in, keep your head up and keep moving forward. And let me know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or send me an email at podcast at coachcarson.com. If you have any questions about this episode, if there's any other topics you'd like me to cover related to this transition of the three phases of being a rental property investor, I would love to hear from you. And if you like topics like this, I also have a free weekly newsletter that shares stories, case studies, and lessons that'll help you on your journey to financial freedom as a rental investor. So check out the link below in the description for my newsletter. You also get some free goodies, tools, and spreadsheets that'll make you a better rental investor. You've been listening to the podcast, Real Estate Investing with Coach Carson. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a show to help you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.